So the afternoon sessions, as you have seen, uh, include two substantive sessions on the technology development that is uh, very actively underway right now in advance of the April 2013 launch. We are keeping expectations low with the hope of outperforming, of course. Um, we've got some wonderful partners who are working with the Secretariat and with the DPLA um, Technical Aspects Workstream to do that. And one of the people who has been at the core of this effort is uh, a man named Jeffrey Licht, who's on his way up to the um, uh, podium right now. Jeffrey is uh, a partner to the effort um, as uh, a consultant and really the sort of core project manager for technology uh, all the way around, trying to implement what we have heard from the community in the technical aspects workstream led by Martin and SJ and others in that respect. Uh, Jeffrey comes from uh, a group called Pod, Pod Consulting. He's a partner at Pod, which is a uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts-based firm that we've had a lot of experience working well with. Uh, he also is at Sapient, one of the big uh, integrator firms uh, as well uh, in an international setting. Um, and we're very lucky that he has devoted himself so uh, substantively to this project, Jeffrey Licht. Thank you, John. Um, so I guess the purpose of this is to really start getting specific about what it is that we're actually going to be building for April um, and in the process for getting there. There's been, we've been talking a lot about you know, big visions, big goals, and wonderful content. At some point, we actually need to build something specific, and this is what, what I want to do is just give a very, try to give as clear a picture as possible of what we're planning to do for April. Um, so. You know, we can all go out and communicate that to the world, and also if it's wrong or you have some questions, we can give you enough detail so you can, um, you can try to answer those questions. So this is what I said. I want to give a, a concrete picture. I also want to talk about how, what our progress is in terms of getting towards that goal, how we're moving, what the plan is between now and April, and um, very importantly, talk about the different opportunities for getting um, different groups involved, because we know there are a lot of people who want to contribute to the DPLA in some way, either by attending these meetings. Um, there's a very good opportunity for contributing very solidly in the technical front, and we need to make sure we make those opportunities as clear as possible and um, make sure that there are things that are going to actively contribute to our, um, to our April launch. So this is sort of the, the big picture of what the DPLA platform for April 2013 is going to look like. So we are building, at the core of it, is a metadata repository, which is going to be um, aggregated from the various service hubs and content hubs. Uh, there's a ingestion process, which is going to basically take the con aggregate the content from those hubs and put it in the repository in a form that can be easily used. And sort of most importantly, there's an API on top of it. And I think that's something we, I, we haven't actually been talking about a lot today so far that I've heard, but the API is really the mechanism by which we're going to expose the great content that's within the DPLA to the world. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, API is Application Programming Interface. It's basically a set of, um, of um, transactions or calls that you can make against the API that will let you do stuff with the repository. And I think this is one of the um, sort of key distinguishing factors in the DPLA, overall DPLA platform, because we're not telling you you can only go look at it through this website. We're not restricting the API to a subset of people who have special privileges to do it. Everything goes through the API, and everybody has the same level of access, and that will be access to all the information they have within the repository. We're also, um, you'll see up there, there's a front end, which is going to be built on top of the API, which will be sort of the, um, you know, the place where people can go in April to browse the content within the, within the API, and then lots of colored boxes which represent all the great stuff that we expect people to build on, on top of the API. And one of our main success criteria here is in the ways that we'll know that we've done the right thing is that people um, want to build stuff on top of the API, that they have the ability to build stuff on top of the API, and they actually build stuff that people want to use. And um, you know, we're going to talk a little bit later about how, how we want to make that happen. Um, but that is something which depends critically on the community of developers that we want to build around the DPLA participating and getting engaged in it. Um, the other piece here is the, you know, there are things that we expect people are going to want to be able to do with the content within the DPLA that aren't necessarily practical to do through the API. Um, an example is, you think about Hathi Trust, you have, the, you can, um, 
if you want to do analysis of the entire corpus of material that you have within the repository, that's not something you can easily do in the API. So we're providing a mechanism by which you can just take a copy of the whole of all the data and do what you want with it. And since you know, as I believe the, the rights for all the metadata are going to be CC zero, that is something that we can actually do. Finally, one other piece of this is that we've got this. Um, we want to package all this up, not just the content, but the code, the entire infrastructure, in a way that um, anybody else can go and take the entire DPLA platform and run it locally, run it on a cloud server, just have the ability to get that set up, which will, we hope will foster um, you know, the development of tools that might be useful in a more local environment, and um, uh, you know, has other benefits which we'll talk about in a bit. But, the main thing here is like when we talk when when I today talk about the D play platform, what I'm referring to is the purple stuff. So that's sort of the core of what's what we're putting together. So in terms of the metadata repository, this is um, you know, we are building this is a little remedial for everybody who's 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 been involved in this, but we are building a metadata repository. We are not building a full content repository. It's just metadata. Um, metadata is information about the content. Um, and as we've talked about um, today, that's going to be aggregated from the various service hubs and content hubs that, um, that participate in the DPLA. There are different types of entities or objects that we're going to be storing metadata about. We have this concept of an item, which is an object that we have metadata for, um, like a newspaper or an image or a piece of text. We also want to keep track of collections so that um, when you have, for example, we often have many items that come from a particular collection, we want to keep the relationship between those items and that collection together and have some information about the collection, which gives valuable context to um, the people who are looking at that item and trying to understand what it is and trying to find it. We also want to keep track of contributors in terms of who's actually contributed the object to the DPLA, so we have, um, you know, know what that source is. And also, something which is a little farther out in the roadmap, but is, you know, opens up some really interesting possibilities is the idea of events around objects. So, um, you know, if you have, you know, if we're dealing with book data, for example, an event might be that somebody has read the book or borrowed the book or someone has, you know, viewed the object. Um, by keeping track of the information, it enables us to do some interesting things in terms of highlighting most used items and um, you know, providing some uh, additional guidance in terms of navigating through the repository to find stuff that you know, other people find interesting and find um, things that other people who are looking at the things that you might like might find interesting. So. Um, this is just an example of metadata just being super explicit about the types when we talk about metadata, this is what we're talking about. Our schema is based on Dublin qualified Dublin Core. We have a, um, we published the draft schema out on the DPLA wiki. We're starting to get some, some very good feedback on it, which we're gonna, which we're gonna be addressing, which is great. We, I would encourage everybody to, who you know, ha has an opinion to take a look and, and send us your thoughts. But we are, you know, these are pretty much some basic Dublin core items. Um, we're also planning on keeping track of uh, having previews for the items in the repository. Um, but you know, this is sort of what's gonna be coming in. And as we talked, heard in the, um, discussion around service hubs, you know, we're expect, part of our expectation is that the service hubs are doing a certain amount of quality control and standardization, normalization before the data comes to us. Because obviously, one of the big challenges in dealing with um, a repository which is aggregation of lots of other repositories is inconsistent metadata, metadata with various levels of detail. Um, and, uh, you know, we want we at the, you know at the DPLA we don't obviously have the the people to go through and, and fix all the metadata so we're going to be relying heavily on the service hubs to do the best job that that they can um, the and we'll talk, talk about a bit more about that in terms of ingestion I don't know can anybody guess where this comes from nobody <laughs> Clemson South Carolina that's right. And obviously, the, um, the thumbnail doesn't really work blown up to like six feet high, but there you go. Um, okay, content sources. This is, these are the service hubs and the content hubs that we've been discussing so far. Um, 
you know, obviously these are primarily cultural heritage objects that we're talking about. There are lots of newspapers. We, we are definitely planning to include books in the, in the, um, um, you know, in the first, in the first iteration by April, once we get the, you know, the data sorted out. The, we are starting out by doing OAI PMH harvesting to get the metadata from the content, from the service hubs. That's going to work for four or five of them. There's some which don't have that harvesting set up right now, which will provide us a good chance to test out some of the other ingestion mechanisms that we want to use. So, you know, you know, we're starting the OAI PMH. It's not because we think it's, you know, the greatest thing in the universe or, um, you know, it's, it's what we want to do, but a lot of content out, out there available through it. And so we want to, in the interest of getting things moving and getting real content into the system, we want to start with that um, so we can get going as quickly as possible. So ingestion. So this is, we are building an ingestion pipeline, ingestion process that is going to manage the retrieval of content from the various content service hubs and sort of normalizing it, cleaning up, and putting it into the repository. So obviously there are different elements to this, actually getting the files, doing format translations is necessary, um, and then sort of enrichment and normalization. One of the things that we are expecting, that we're expecting not to do is really try to manage or massage the metadata within the DPLA itself, because we simply do not have you know, the people or the time. We're not the people who are going to be closest to the content. So uh, you know, we, want, you know, we want that cleanup to be done before it gets to us. But we know that there are always going to be, um, there are always going to be inconsistencies or differences between the different aggregators and different service hubs that we're dealing with. That's just a fact of life. So we're going to have to, we want to have a library of essentially modules and cleanup routines and enrichments that we can apply to the content as it comes in to, you know, normalize date format. So if we have two separate date formats that are coming in, we can figure it out, we can standardize it um, for ourselves and not have to try to get all the different service hubs and content hubs to standardize what they're providing us um, because that would be difficult. Um, it would be very difficult. Um, and the other reason is that we, um, there are certain functions that we want to provide through the API that depend on certain types of data being available. So for example, if, um, you know, one way of browsing the data within the repository could be let's look at a timeline and see what types of, you know, what's happening around 1950, 1945 and 1955. If we have content that comes in with a date a range of, say, you know, 20th century, you know, does that go on the timeline or does it not? We need to basically um, massage the data to a point where we can, act, we can use it effectively within the visualizations and then in the navigational paths we're providing people through the API and through the front end so that they can actually get to the content. Another example might be doing, if we get, um, you know, simple things like getting, if we get a city, we need to figure out what the actual latitude and longitude of that city is and make sure that we have that in our repository so when we do geographic searches, we can pick it up. Um, we have a lot of ideas around this, and you know, this is not something that's new. A lot of people are doing this, um, but the, the goal is to gradually increase the library of enrichments that we're applying so that we can, um, over time, not have to rebuild these things and reuse them for, for each of the um, different service hubs and content hubs that we bring on board. The final, another piece of the ingestion process is that one of the concerns that came up yesterday when you we were talking about metadata and the technical architecture is how do we make sure that we don't unnecessarily lose the richness of the data that we're getting? I mean, for example, we're getting MARC records. They have a lot of data that's not, that's not going to be part of our core schema. So what we're going to be doing um, is preserving the entire metadata record that we receive uh, for, each, um, for each piece of metadata as, as part of a record. So even if we don't have you know, we'll do all the mapping to get to a standardized set of metadata, but the original record will still be there for anybody to be able to retrieve it through the API. Um, and we would, ideally, we would like to be able to index that so you can do faceted search and faceted browsing based on fields that may be specific to a particular collection or a particular repository, a particular type of data. We're not exactly sure how we're going to do that yet, but that's one of the goals. But we figure that by keeping the complete original set of metadata there, that gives us a lot more flexibility in the future to, um, you know, to do interesting things. 
So for the API, what the API is basically going to allow you to do is going to allow you to search stuff and do faceted search. It's, it's pretty, much, pretty much what it's going to allow you to do. So you can do keyword search, you can do date range searches, location searches. Uh, faceted browsing is absolutely a key part of this, so you can narrow your search down to everything that's within Colorado and then narrow down by date and so on and so forth. That's the, the key functionality. It's, very, it's pretty similar to what we would have seen in the, um, the alpha version API that came out you know, back in April. So it's, it's, it's a similar in terms of the types of functionality it's exposing. The API is going to be completely, it's going to be a REST API. It's going to be pure HTTP to connect to and retrieve data. We're going to allow you to specify whether you want to get the data back in JSON, in XML, maybe in schema.org HTML. Um, linked data is sort of something we're not really fully addressing right now, but it's something we know is in the future. Um, and we also want to, to make this useful to people, we want to provide you know, documentation so it's easy to use, full documentation of the API, sample code, and potentially libraries for common, like, like a Python library or a Ruby library that you can use to just very easily access the API. Um, these, those are also things which potentially members of the community might be able to build as well. One of the, one of the questions that came up yesterday was how does somebody who is you know, not particularly te technically savvy or doesn't have you know, technical people on staff, how can they take advantage of the API? So an example of the type of thing you might be able to do is uh, it's, it's certainly possible to build a JavaScript widget which would make a given a, a title or a search box go to our API get the data back and display it. It's something which should be just dropped into any, any web page anywhere without any particular programming experience. So that's the kind of, that's the kind of thing which, um, you know, actually I'd expect someone, else, someone is going to build as soon as you make the API fully available because it's pretty easy to do, but we would want to be able to put that out there so we build easy on-ramps for people to get using the API. So the point of the API is to get people to use it. Um, one of our big challenges and things we're trying to do is to make sure that we're making it easy for people to do that. So we've heard about the, the you may be familiar with the beta sprinters who did work um, even during the past year. So we're looking at a, continuing that effort to, so people can build some more substantial things on top of the API and prove it out for us and let us know what we've done right and what we haven't done right. Because if someone's trying to build something on top of the API that's going to be useful and it looks like it's going to be valuable to the community, but they can't do it because of X, Y, or Z, we want to know that. And the only way you can really do that is by getting people to use it. It just I mean we can do all the theoretical design that we want, but that's really the proof. We also um, have an app fest, which is scheduled for November 8th and 9th in Chattanooga. And I encourage you all to sign up for that, give your ideas for what you want somebody to build for you. Um, and you know, that's sort of continuing the vein of hackathons that have been a part of the DPLA um, for a while now. As I mentioned before, documentation, sample code, client libraries, all those good things to make it as easy, easy as possible for people to come on board and start using it. So in terms of the front end, we heard earlier um, somebody mentioned that iFactory has, has been retained to essentially build the front end. And so I guess we need to be really careful what we say about the front end, because it's not the front end. It's a front end to the DPLA. That's a gesture to what the types of things that you could do, a gesture to the possibilities. And the, the scope of that is basically to um, provide search functionality, provide faceted search, provide detail, you know, detailed views of the content within the repository, and also to allow people to you know, identify, you know, form collections of their own and share those collections with other people. So tag things that they want, to, they want to put in a group and then share people and let other people, other people use them. This is, um, I guess, a, a really important thing here is that the, this front end is, does not have any sort of privileged access to the DPLA or to the repository um, compared to any other tool that people might build on top of the API. So you, in theory, anybody could be building this, this, um, this front end right now. But we expect that by having you know, a fairly substantial web application built on top of the API, that will help us figure out, are we actually exposing um, 
exposing the right calls. And it will also help us understand if the cleanup that we're doing as part of the ingestion process is working. Because if, some, if you're trying to build a front end on top of our repository, and you find out that you know, the subjects are, you know, it may become very obvious that the sub browsing by subject is impossible because you know, the subject headings haven't been, um, have been um, normalized properly. That's something that we'll find out very quickly. And then you know, we'll see, is that something that we need right now? Is something we need to later? How can we address it? So in terms of the roadmap, so this is, these are, these are the things that we're trying to build for April 2013. Um, it's, the wet clay metaphor is, is good. I think our, some of our clay is you know, almost slurry, you might say. So it's, <laughs> I mean, the approach that we're taking towards, towards building this out is where it's, it's uh, iteration, it's about move, like moving the ball forward, in, getting real data, seeing what works, and, and just pushing along. We, we don't have sort of a day-by-day a -day plan with you now in April, but we have a set of priorities and a sequence of events in which we want things to happen. Um, and we, you know, we want feedback, we want input. That's sort of the one thing throughout this project that has been, you know, I've been sort of banging the drum, maybe not very effectively because it haven't gotten huge amounts of it, but we really want as many people engaged and, and looking of what we're doing so we can make sure that we're doing the right, doing the right thing. So in terms of the roadmap, for, so this past April there was an alpha version of the API that was put, that was put together. Um, and we're actually, we're actually, and that, that um, is the API that some of you may have worked with or, or seen, seen in the past. That contained a lot of um, many, many book records from Harvard's collection as well as assorted other pieces of metadata. We are sort of following on in the spirit of that API. It's the same, many of the same types of transactions, but really focusing on um, you know, making the ingestion process more, um, less handcrafted, less boutique-y, more, more industrial strength, and um, putting, the whole, putting the whole thing on a more of a production footing that will carry us forward over the next you know, months and, and maybe, maybe years. So our immediate milestone is really early November to have a version of the API up which contains some, which allows you to do some stuff and which has some cultural metadata in it because we have an app fest on November 8th and 9th and it's gonna be a really, really sad app fest if there's no API <laughs> or there's no data. So you know, it, it, really, it really concentrates the mind when you have a specific deadline. So previously, DPLA Midwest was my deadline, but then this came up and I thought, oh, that's better. That'll be, that'll be a good thing to work for. Um, so in terms of the front end, the front end design process is kicking off um, on Monday. And we, it's, um, you know, the iFactory is going to be going through a typical design process in terms of doing some discovery, looking at personas, doing wireframes, doing a visual design. And the goal is to get to a, a fully fleshed out design, you know, front end visual interaction design by the end of December, at which point, um, you know, it'll be put into HTML. And then development of that is going to continue um, in parallel with the API development um, in preparation for our launch in April. So the, a couple things about this. One is that the, um, the front end, it's, you know, April 13th is, is just around the corner. It's even more just around the corner than it was, was yesterday. So the front end design process is going to have to move fairly swiftly. And we are still trying to figure out what's the best way to get community involvement so people can see what's being, um, you know, what, what the direction is that we're taking without um, compromising the schedule, which means that, you know, decisions need to be made fairly quickly. So, you know, I'm going to apologize in advance for that. That process is going to sort of be plowing ahead at full speed between now and December. But, um, you know, if you want to provide input and you don't think the opportunities are there, just keep on chasing us and we'll make sure that happens. Um, so between, in parallel with the front end being, you know, once the FS is done, in parallel with the front end being developed, we're just gonna be iterating through and developing the platform. And, you know, we are, it's going to, I guess what I'm saying is we are planning to, once after the app fest, n new versions of the API with the new features that we develop are gonna continually be made available on the public facing site so people can continue working against it and, and seeing what's in there. We are 
going to be taking our sort of general approach is let's take one of our content sources, ingest it, see what doesn't work, fix that, get that to, a, to an appropriate level of, of quality um, so that it doesn't want to do, then do the next content source. And hopefully, as we move through this process, we will, um, subsequent content sources will be easier to do. And if they aren't, then we are obviously doing something wrong. So, but it's basically a continuous process of iterating and improving until, until April. This is a, um, you know, this is a, this is a challenging plan because we're building the front end and integrating and lots of things are going on at the same time. Um, so we are going to do our best to, to keep on top of it. There's a lot of other stuff that we have sort of in the hopper for April. And again, this is going to be prioritized sort of on, um, you know, an, an as we need it basis. So, uh, you know, if we don't have anybody who, if none of the service hubs is trying to provide us data using EAD, then we're not going to, we're not going to do that right now. But this gives you sort of a sense of the types of things that are out there. Um, you know, as, as John said earlier, it's all about opportunity costs and prioritization. So there's a ton of stuff to do. Some of it's going to be before April, some of it's going to be after April. I don't know which is going to be which at this point, or what the main thing is, to, or sort of main priority is to get the core, the core functionality in place, get the ingestion process working, and get the front end in a, in a point which is going to be compelling and interesting. So, as I said, we, we want people to get involved. This, the dev portal on the DPLA wiki is really the best place to find out what's going on. We're posting um, status reports in terms of, um, you know, what's happened in the past week there. That is the, the hub in, um, at which you can get all the information about the schema, all our development documentation. We also have our, our sort of week by week plan is being tracked in Redmine, which is sort of a project management issue tracking system. It's open there, it's public, you can go and see what we're doing and harass us about it if you want to, but it's, um, it, you know, if you really, really want to get in the details, that's what's going on. The code is on GitHub. We have two separate repositories set up now under github.com slash DPLA. Platform and ingestion are the, um, the ones we're starting with, um, which are the platform and the ingestion. And, you know, again, it, you know, once code is, is developed, we push there and you can take a look. And if you're adventurous, you can download it yourself and, um, and see what's going on. So in terms of um, sort of contributing, the Yap Fest is a great place. There's a, a, um, a spot in the DPLA wiki where you can go and suggest things you want people to build, which seems like a great idea, because if they don't build it, you haven't lost anything. And if they do, you've, you've got something. Um, if you can attend, great, register, sign up. Um, and also just, you know, build on top of the API, build something, try something out, see if it works for you, and if it doesn't, let us know. And if it does, great, that'll be exciting. Let us know what features you want. There's also, there are a couple things that we, um, you know, think there are also potential areas for other people to contribute that we haven't really figured out exactly how to do yet. So just to let you know what the, these are on our radar, one is that, um, you know, there, we're planning on building a library of utilities and modules that help in terms of data enrichment and cleanup and so forth. And that seems, and how we're architecting this is that each of those libraries is accessed over a REST, you know, REST API that we use internally. So there's a very, you know, it's in theory possible for someone just to build a module that does, um, you know, entity extraction or some interesting type of um, enrichment that we haven't thought of. So we would like to be able to let people you know, give people the tools to build those modules and plug them in. We haven't quite figured out what the best mechanism for that is yet, either. What the best mechanism for that is yet. We also want to make it easy to, for people to discover other things that people are building on top of the DPLA API. So, um, you know, maybe this is a shared space in GitHub, maybe it's something else. We don't really know yet, but we want, we, what we do know is by the time people start building things with the App Fest, we want there to be a place you can go and see what people are doing um, on top of the API. Uh, all right. So, this, these are the folks who've been working on de developing. Some people, some are developing. Some have been part of a, you know, a team that's been reviewing and and sort of monitoring progress as we go. Um, it's been, you know, it's been great. Um, I, they're also, um, and that's. 
pretty much all I have. I left a lot of time, I think, for questions. So um, I see one right here. It would just, you would want to wait for the microphone. And Um, a lot of libraries. It says it's on. Okay. There you go. A lot of libraries use uh, Drupal to develop a front ends for yep. the various applications, mm -hmm. and uh, it seems like uh, if you had a, if there was a Drupal module for DPLA, this you, you could uh, really leverage a lot of front end uh, development. Has there been any thought of trying to interest uh, someone in the Drupal community or, uh, or, or somebody in the, in the core coding group to uh, uh, come out with a, a Drupal module by uh, April 13th or shortly thereafter? I think, I think that's a great idea. I think it would be a, an excellent app fest thing. As someone in the Drupal community, I would say yes. That's, that's great. We don't, we, don't have any, we don't have any specific plans to build ourselves right now. But it would be a great app fest thing. A question over there? Or a comment, I should say. Jeff, um, I'm wondering, uh, given the fact that most of us have to do a lot of reporting of things uh, to justify the work we're doing, mm -hmm. I'm wondering what, as far as analytics and metrics, has been talked about from the uh, infrastructure side? Um, I think it's been talked about to the extent that we want to have reporting and analytics, but we haven't. <laughs> but it, it's, um, I think once we, but it's, it's one of the things, we know we need to do it, we haven't drilled down to the detail. I expect once we, the first time we run into an issue, we're gonna say, okay, we need some analytics and reporting on this, and then we'll start building it at that point. So, but if there's specific analytics or reporting that you think would be useful, then that would be definitely something we'd like to know about. Any other comments or questions? Um, okay. oh, when, yeah. when, when you said search DPLA, what exactly does that mean? What are you, ser what are you searching? You're doing, that would be a, a, I, either a full text search of all the metadata um, or a search constrained by a particular field, or it's a date search constrained by a date range of some kind, or a location search. Actually, one thing I forgot to mention earlier is just in terms of um, you know, technology that we're using to build this, there's a whole layer of discussion underneath this I don't really want to get into because it, you know, it's pretty time consuming, probably of interest to only a smaller subset of people. But we are, we are using, um, Elasticsearch to provide the core searching and fast search functionality. The repository is going to be in CouchDB. And then we're also using a bunch of um, code from the Recollection Project the Library of Congress to kick off the ingestion work. So we're relying on that. Any other comments? I don't want to cut anyone else off. I think we're good. Go for it. Um, so there's a, uh, one email we got from David Rothman, who's been a uh, frequent participant in the DPLA discussions online, and I thought I'd just take this opportunity to share his idea, just float it up. Yeah. Hello? Thank you. Um, it's not exactly a tech dev idea, but it's one that you might react to and get it on the record. Um, David's suggestion is that the DPLA eventually, not necessarily the first mm -hmm. version, uh, think about serving as a digital locker for books and other items for library patrons to use and enjoying eternal access to content they bought from Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and other places, even if it were sort of a spin-off idea. Mm -hmm. Now, this is not clearly core to where we've been going, and I know it raised a lot of uh, other issues, but I wonder how, just to use this as an example, we might think about sort of keeping in a parking lot a bunch of ideas, such as this one from uh, Mr. Rothman in a, um, I don't know if it's someday desired functionality, yeah. or how you're thinking about mm -hmm. uh, ideas like this that obviously we'd have to think about as a policy matter. Would we ever accept DRM? Would we, you know, mm -hmm. uh, lots of things would flow from it, but uh, just so we kind of capture thoughts early in the process that aren't going to be in the 
the April 2013 version, but we might want to return to conceptually. I think that would be great. I mean, it would be, I think it would be definitely useful to have a place where all the things that we've thought about on the radar and either we've said, you know, it's our understanding we're not going to be doing this or we want to do it at some point in the future and giving people a way to, um, to contribute to that would be, would be great. So that's something we can get, that is something we can set up. Yeah, okay. Um, I know this isn't a question that applies to the situation between now and April, yeah. but it's a question that's hovered over my mind for a long time. Um, we talk about orphan works in a, mm -hmm. in a um, paper environment. Mm -hmm. I often think of this whole world of bastard works in a digital environment. That is to say, um, digital uh, archives of material that have been built in HTML yeah. Uh, and that uh, cannot be ingested. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've been doing an awful lot of work with incredibly rich depositories mm -hmm. that just cannot come in. Yeah. Uh, what kind of um, ideas are there out there for automating the ingestion of this kind of stuff? So I mean, this is something that we, we have, has been on our radar and we've called it the web harvester, basically. and. The, the idea is you would point it at a collection, like essentially a website which contains a collection, and then, um, you know, it sounds, it's not easy, it's hard, but, you know, go and harvest that and, like, try to understand, like, based on the um, clues in terms of the URLs, the hierarchy of the content, figure out what the structure of it is, and then, um, you know, basically pull out the data and get it ready and have it prepare for ingestion into the DPLA. Obviously, there are a lot of pieces to that. You know, there's certainly a certain amount of, you know, probably tweaking to, you know, read, you know, read out the website, look at the data, come back, tweak the settings so we can f identify the particular fields that map to particular fields of deep play, and there's, it's more of a, a, a cleansing process. That could be something, uh, another idea that came up the, um, yesterday was looking at the service hubs. So we have service hubs right now that are geographically based, essentially. There's no reason why there couldn't be a service hub whose job was to um, you know, work with smaller groups who have websites that have um, rich data in it, and they could build the tools to ingest that data, um, deal with a lot of the sort of hands-on communication and manual work that would be required, maybe crowdsourcing that or however you want, but handling those interactions, and then feed to the DPLA a cleaned up, um, you know, a cleaned up feed that we could then use. It does, it, that does introduce some other complications because one of the things that we're doing in terms of looking at the, it, the data that we're getting from service hubs is part of our remit, you know, we think, is to go and make sure that you know, the original content's still there and, you know, get changes and so forth. So in an environment where you're doing a one-time ingestion of website and then cleaning it up and then filling the deplay, that becomes a little more problematic. Um, but I think that's a great example of where a service hub could spring up and you know, take, on, you know, take on that type of role. concludes the session. Yep. Jeffrey, great job. We will reconvene here in uh, about 3.45. Thank you.